Hi everyone and welcome to The Edit by DH. My name is Deborah, and I have a very, very, very special guest with me today, Vithya Visvendra. You guys may have seen as part of my De Unedited series that I began not that long ago. I did a part one on the C word, which was talking about children. You guys obviously saw why I chose or choose not to have children. And honestly, I was so thankful for all the supportive comments that you guys gave once watching the video. I promised a part two with a guest and I promised a different perspective. And I'm honestly so thankful to Vithya for agreeing to be a part of this and to talk about something that is not easy in the slightest. Before we get onto the topic, I wanted to first introduce this guest. And to be honest, I know her as Vithya. She's my friend. And honestly, I know she's accomplished so much, but when I was looking into all her accolades, I can't even list all of them, to be honest, because this whole video will be one hour of her achievements. So let me take a deep breath and just give you some you know, highlights or what I thought were highlights of her life and career. So she's almost got 300,000 followers and, and subscribers on Instagram and YouTube, which is insane. She started as a makeup artist, but now she is one of the biggest makeup artists and names in the Tamil community. She does gorgeous bridal makeup as well as hair and sari draping. And I'm sure she's a counselor for bridal breakdowns as well. But she also does very high fashion editorial shoot makeup as well, which I've seen and drooled all over, as well as being a model herself. She's an educator. She's done many, many, many large scale masterclasses all over the world, but she also does private masterclasses as well. She's worked with many South Indian movie stars. She's featured in music videos and collaborated with a German rapper, Majo, which is just insane. I think you performed recently as well on stage. Where was that, by the way? It was in Germany, yeah. Germany, my <laughs> God. It, in front yeah. of 10,000 people, yeah, that was insane, actually. 10,000? <laughs> 7,000. 7,000. I mean, that's still like almost 10,000. Oh my <laughs> God. So yeah, her new name is Beyonce. I've, I've renamed her. Um, <laughs> collaborated with, did you collaborate with Amex? Yeah, it was for Amex Malaysia. Yeah. Amex Malaysia. She's collaborated and partnered with so many charities. She continues to advocate for mental health issues on her platform as well as other areas. She's a judge and mentor for Miss and Mrs. Asia Great Britain. She's a brand ambassador for so many brands. And mm -hmm. I think this is so exciting. She recently finally got her blue tick verified. Which, <laughs> Thank huge you. Congratulations. It was a long time coming. So, yeah, I mean, that's so many things, as I'm sure you guys would yeah. understand and agree. But there were so many more. And I just love the fact that Vithya has achieved so much, yet she remains so humble and that you use your platform for good, not just for talking about makeup or beauty in general. And I love the fact that you raise awareness on issues, particularly on topics such as mental health, which I know is very important to you and a, a topic close to your heart. I wanted to talk a little bit about how we met very briefly. So I used to work in beauty, as you guys know, and I started mainly, one of the main brands I worked for was Bobby Brown. And Vithya walked into the store one day, she was a client, and I basically stalked her a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and then we agreed to do a collaboration. She kindly agreed to collaborate in our store for Bobby Brown. And she did this amazing masterclass for Bobby Brown. And it was spoken about for ages within the brand. And, and then after that, when I moved to Niles, I forced her to come to Niles too and do another, <laughs> another masterclass. Yeah. And then since then, we've just remained friends. So she's a, a friend that I'm really proud to call a friend. So thank you very oh, much for agreeing to do this. I'm so proud of you too. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the topic. Obviously, I mentioned that it's the C word, children. I spoke about my choice not to have children. Vithya is a guest on today's episode because she's actually made it very public on her platforms about not being able to have a child or children. I'm sure there are people who are watching this who know your story already, but for those who don't, I think it will be great to start with that in your own words. Mm -hmm. 
hi thank you for everything the little introduction that was quite amazing and thank you so much for actually stalking me after the Bobby Brown <laughs> class <laughs> because yeah like we got to work together but then obviously this friendship blossomed and it's been so many years I don't even remember like I think it's already been like six seven years maybe more I guess I don't even know what I think more I think yeah more. right like it's been a really long time so yeah so it's been nice and it's nice that rather than just having like a friendship on the surface it's nice that we do talk about very deep things and and that's why when you invited me on this first of all I'm so proud of you for doing this this series I think it's you know it's it's important and I think and I hope a lot of women get to watch this and you know it it helps them somehow and you know um inspires them um so it's it's an honor to actually even be asked to be on this and I do definitely feel comfortable to talk to you and stuff yeah like I did speak about this it was something it, it's a hard one because I didn't know for the longest time myself why I couldn't conceive it's something that I didn't want to go and find out like I think it was something that was quite traumatic for me and then over the years you know coming from a South Asian community they expect you to get married and have children straight away so it was the the pressure so eventually I felt like I had no choice but to go check myself and find out what's going on and then I think having spoken to several Guyanese like around the world whenever I travel you know somebody will be like oh you should go to a doctor in India you should go see a doctor in Malaysia you should go see you know and then and then I did and everyone told me the same thing and it, it was to do with my uterus it was something that something that happened to me a really long time ago and I think it's the the term is endometriosis there's several other things with it as well it's it's not just the one label but I think it was just so many other things and then I found out that I definitely can't conceive even if I did it would probably end up in miscarriages so the options they gave me were things like surrogacy or potentially adoption and so anyway before we talk on to that part like not being able to conceive was something that I had to deal with for the longest time and never knowing how to explain it and then when I did use my platform to kind of say guys I officially can't have biological children and it was more rather than sharing my story I, I almost feel like this is the first time I'm going to be sharing my story I feel like I've always mentioned sentence and then said I can't conceive but I hope other women you know it was almost like giving other women support who don't have children or who don't choose to have children rather than really talking about me and what I went through if that makes sense it's just more a case of like hey it's okay especially on Mother's Day I would just kind of you know try and extend that support yeah and then today you're I'm, I'm here and I'm talking to you so going to be interesting <laughs> like I said it's it's such a challenging topic to to speak on I know you have done a blog on it and I think it was titled motherhood and mm. you, you kind of spoke about it. it was quite a short blog but you know everything that's quite important you shared on there but like you said it's almost like the first time you're really speaking on it or have an opportunity to speak on it so that's why I wanted to really have this open conversation with you about it you obviously mentioned that it's in the community you get asked a lot and how do you how do you deal with that when when people ask you you know I think initially when people used to ask me I used to answer in a very aggressive and angry way like I would just make sarcastic comments back saying oh yeah I'll have a child for you tomorrow or yep it's coming and it will just be like kind of yeah just very passive aggressive really and then it just made me want to not go to these family events because I it was just that anxiety that I would have before going knowing that somebody is just going to ask oh you know, why don't you have children yet? And I, I've even stopped speaking to family members because every phone conversation would be, you should have children. Why are you not having children? And the worst, the worst one that I got from, a, from an uncle that I was actually really close to was that he actually told me that there is no way I would have a successful marriage if I don't give my husband a child. And that for me was the ultimate, okay, you know what? I, I can't, ever speak to you about this because if this is what you're going to tell me every single time it is going to be embedded in my mind and I'm going to constantly think whenever I have problems with my husband that it's because I've not given him a child and and I didn't want that I didn't want that in the back of my mind all the time and stuff so now when I do go to events I'm okay I'm okay talking about it meaning if if somebody does ask me 
like, why don't you have children? Or, oh, do you have children? How long have you been married? And and I would just answer saying, no, I don't. And yeah, we we don't have any children. And, you know, and if if we if I feel comfortable and I, and I feel like the person asked me genuinely and, you know, with some sort of concern, I would then go on to saying I actually can't conceive children, but we're OK with it. And nobody asks me anything else. But the, the ones where you know, if you do say that, they're going to go on to saying, oh, but I know this guy, you should try them out or you should go here. And you sh-. and I don't want to have that conversation. And I don't try and encourage that conversation. So it, I usually just kind of see how somebody asks me that question. Do they ask me in a nosy way or are they asking you genuinely? And, you know, and sometimes I... Uh, met somebody at a party and I remember we were having this conversation saying oh like how long have you been married and then I think naturally we both asked each other if we had kids and then I think she went on to saying I actually can't conceive and then I responded saying oh I I can't conceive as well and then I think we had this heartfelt conversation at a birthday party like I that's the first time I met her and we just bonded that moment because we we were able to relate to each other and it's not a common you know, it's not a com- common conversation you'd have somewhere because people don't openly talk about this. And so we just kind of talked about how it impacted us. And yeah, so I think sometimes it is good to talk about this because you never know whether somebody else is going through the same or, you know, maybe something you might say might click something in them and then they might think, actually, it's okay. Like, you know, it's okay that I can't conceive and why should I hide that or why should I be embarrassed about that, right? Right. Absolutely. No, you're right. Like, actually, I feel like I think I said this in my first video, that I feel like there are a lot of women that can't conceive. And yet, I don't feel like it's spoken about that much. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and fair enough, because like I said earlier, it's such a sensitive topic, and people are still dealing with different emotions. And, you know, it's almost akin to a grief to grief, I guess. I can't claim to know how that feels. And like you said, when you meet somebody that has the same, you know, challenges as you do, it's a different kind of bonding because only you guys know exactly what that feels like. So I can completely understand when you mentioned meeting the other other person. Mm -hmm. But I think in general, the not just the South Indian or Asian, like every all of Asia, they're just very, (laughs) I think, very nosy. They're just always asking inappropriate questions. I mean, <laughs> in the Western world, we consider inappropriate questions. And I know sometimes it's not malicious. Like you said, it yeah. depends on the intention of the person. But yeah. I completely get you trying to filter through. Does this person have, you know, a genuine intention or are they just trying to be whatever? Yeah. So yeah, exactly. I completely get that. So what would you say then helped you, if anything, deal with it, I guess? I mean, I guess it's it's never a concluded thing. It's not like, oh, this has helped you and that's the end of this, the thing. It's the ongoing cycle that you're going through. But yeah. if anything, what, what helped you deal with this? Well, several things. I'm trying to think what helped me first, but I would probably say a lot of my friends my age have children now and honestly, even if any of them were in this room right now, they'll agree that I had a very hard time getting on with their children. Like it was, it was almost like I would tell them, Hey, can we meet up outside of your home? Can we meet up without the kids? And, you know, it would always be this comment that I would make and, you know, and then they were fine. Initially, they would always come and meet me outside. But then I think eventually it started actually affecting our friendship because they, they felt like I didn't want to be part of their life you know and that I wasn't making an effort with their children and it was really hard for them constantly having to leave the kids with I don't know with a babysitter or somebody else and stuff they they felt that I wasn't being very empathetic and we had to have this heart to heart conversation where I said to them it's not that I don't like your children I have a hard time being around children and it it's somehow triggers something in me and I sit there and I have this you know it's like one minute I'm okay next minute I'm not and and I I felt like I needed to deal with that myself so I think once I have that heart-to-heart conversation with my best friends who all have kids I was able to then see what it is that actually bothers me about being around these children and then it was therapy it was actually speaking to a professional talking to them about 
my emotions and why it bothers me and what what it is that bothers me being around kids and you know the the emotions around it the triggers around it and stuff and I think once I pass that now I have such a great relationship with my friend's kids and I love being around them and I get so excited I sometimes even do school runs with some of my friends because I'm like I really want to see the kids and um and it doesn't there is no bitterness there is no feeling of like well I don't have any you know so I don't want to be around them when I think that was an emotion that I I guess I went through for a really long time and this constant moment of like telling myself oh I'm okay with no kids and then having this emotion of like oh my god like I think I would like to have kids or then going through that emotion of like wait am I a woman like am I like am I not supposed to and you know it like am I is there something faulty with me and then going through that emotion of just like nah I don't like kids and I just want to have a great life and spend my money on my Chanel bags and you know like it's it's there were so many things And I guess I projected that a little bit on Instagram or social media as well, where one person would say to me, like, "Uh, I thought you wanted to adopt, but now you don't want to adopt anymore. Or somebody else would say, hey, I thought you wanted to do surrogacy, but then why are you not? Or like, or then they would say, you know, so, so I think, uh, I think people were able to tell. And then I think I had to really sort of sit back and be like, right, I need to organize my thoughts and I need to organize my feelings and say to myself, what is the problem? What do I want? And what do I want with my husband? And have these really like uncomfortable conversations, I guess, with people around me, because I realized, like I said, you know, being around my friends and their kids, or even having my parents constantly comment saying, oh, when am I going to have grandchildren? And and being able to have that heart-to-heart conversation with every single important person around my life to then acknowledge and take that sort of, you know, just accept it and then and then being okay with it. Whereas like now I'm so okay with it and I'm I'm able to have this conversation with you today as well. And the blog was quite recent as well, even though a lot of people have known for a really long time that, I, you know, I would mention adoption or I would mention surrogacy or whatever, whatever that I can't conceive. But then I think after that blog, it was that little introduction of like, you know, here you go. But then just obviously never went into detail about it. There were so many things you said it um within the last bit no no I was like I have to remember this for therapy obviously you said that helped you so you would definitely recommend therapy to other people who perhaps are going through the same thing yeah I mean I I think the first most important thing is trying to speak to the people that you love and care about I think that's probably the first step that you should do ideally you know definitely if you have a partner husband have that conversation with him first of course and then the people around you your friends your family whatever but if some people don't have that though they don't have a great support system and I, and I you know I completely um, understand that so I think for those people definitely the first step would be to speak to a professional I still think no matter whether you have a support system or not I think therapy is amazing anyway you always get to hear a different perspective perspective and you don't have to feel embarrassed or uncomfortable or humiliated to talk to somebody who absolutely doesn't have any clue and doesn't know you or or your surroundings and being able to just openly talk to them about all your feelings I think is great it's just so liberating absolutely I think that's the concern that some people have about therapy if they haven't had therapy before it's that notion of speaking to a complete stranger but on the flip side of that that's oh. one of the advantages of speaking to a therapist because, yeah. because they don't know anything about you. So they don't have any preconceived ideas about you or anything yeah. like that. And they won't be judgmental. So you can say whatever you say, you know, and whatever you want to say, and you know, you won't get judged. Whereas you're always going to have that fear though, when you do talk to your family and your friends about it, because there is that, you know, that fear of like being judged or them going and telling their friends or family you know and yeah I'm not saying it's gonna happen when you do speak to your family or friends but I'm just saying like if if that's a fear then why not try a therapist absolutely you briefly touched upon open communications with family and loved ones and if you're okay speaking about it how how did your family react to it when you when you shared that with them again I think it's sometimes how you have that conversation like when when my mum would make that comment 
you know, gosh, trust me, I'm, I'm 38 now. So this conversation started from my early 20s, like not even a conversation. It would be it would be these snidey comments or it would just be like, oh, why? Why do you not give me grandchildren or why don't I have grandchildren? I'm going to die and I'm not going to meet any grand. Like, you know, it would just be like these these phrases that would be thrown around in random conversations. And so naturally I would give them that like a sarcastic answer or it would just be like, you know, so I guess nobody ever took it seriously, but then my parents never realized actually how much it mentally impacted me and how much I would have anxiety over it. And and I think one day I had, like once I was able to really think sort through my emotions and feelings about this I was able to just say to my mom not not I didn't just grab her one day sat her down and said look I'm gonna have this conversation with you it's just when she made that comment again on a random day I then had to say to her look you can't say this to me anymore it upsets me and this is the situation I have seen loads of Guyanese like what do you what else do you want me to do and and I think what, once that kind of opened up that conversation, I was able to then really tell her how I feel, and she was really able to listen to me. And and I must admit, I think in the in the last two years, maybe my mum doesn't ask me; she doesn't talk about it, and she doesn't raise it. I know it's something my parents are sad about, um, but at the end of the day, they know that I I've explained it to them, and they've just had to accept it I think like I said they, they don't bother with it when she does have conversations especially surrogacy is has been a conversation that we've had in the last two years a lot uh, within the family but when she does approach that now she's a little bit more considerate she knows that it's a sensitive topic so she'll ask me and she'll see if she can help me somehow even if it's financially she's like look I'll, I'll happily pay for the surrogacy if that's something that's stopping you and and I think those are healthy conversations which is something that I didn't have with my parents for the longest time so I think it's important how you have these conversations with people that you love and care about absolutely and I think with a lot of our parents and their generation where they've come to England or wherever as immigrants you know they didn't grow up having these conversations because it wasn't the norm it wasn't the norm to talk about mental health or feelings in general god forbid you know it's just like you know pull up your socks suck it up and get on with it it's like that kind of you know attitude so in a way it's we can't necessarily blame our parents for being the way that they are but like you said by hopefully having these open conversations Mm. with them and like you said having healthy conversations in a healthy way or healthy environment I think it really can make an impact it won't happen overnight because for sure it doesn't happen with my mom overnight but you know (laughs) eventually you get there hopefully You also briefly touched upon surrogacy and adoption and how people felt like you were changing your mind, I guess. Firstly, Mm -hmm. on that, I just wanted to say that it's really no one's business what you (laughs) decide to do, not just you, anyone decides to to do in their life. Like, it's very unrealistic to say you make one decision and then you stick with it for the rest of your life. It can be, you know, it depends on the environment you're living. It depends on different factors, you know, all around you. So I I know that I wanted kids when I was about to get married, before I got married. And during the course of my relationship, I changed my mind. And that's perfectly, I'm well within my right to change my mind. In the same way, you're perfectly within your right to change your mind. So I just wanted to say it's none of their business, what you decide to do, because it's your life, it's your body. But I I did want to ask you, like, what is your stance on it now, if you don't mind me asking about surrogacy or adoption from what you just said as well absolutely I agree with you it is no one's business I think what a lot of people fail to understand as well is whoever had followed me from when I first started Instagram I've literally been on Instagram or social media over 10 years so I think in in that 10 years I was married previously went through a divorce shifted countries got remarried and you know it was literally from the early 20s and now I'm in my you know, mid late thirties and stuff. Right. So I feel like you will change your mind and you will grow and you will mature and you will have different perspectives in life. And you will, you know, it's just like your, your whole life and lifestyle and surroundings, everything changes. And it it is unfair that somebody who has maybe followed you five, six years ago, picks on something that you've said maybe then, and then comes back and says, Oh, what a hypocrite, because you've said this and you've said that. And and it, it should be okay that we do change our minds. And I have gone through, trust me, in the 10 years, changing my mind so much about children and the the idea about children. First, I would say 
I don't really like them. I'm so glad that I don't have any children. And then it was that whole, literally a long period where I was very miserable and very depressed that I couldn't have children. And then looking into adoption agencies and how does it work, lawyers, how much does it cost and things like that. And then because a lot more women openly talk about surrogacy, I didn't even know what surrogacy was even five years ago. And so now that a lot of women are having surrogacies, it, you know, it's that whole open conversation about that where you're just like, oh, I didn't even know that you could do that and that there was that, that option. So I think now we are at that stage where we're like, okay, we're, we're talking more about surrogacy than anything else. But the thing is, because we've just moved back to England, um, you know, we lived away, we moved, we're trying to settle in again. We just bought a house, we renovated the house. And there are so many things. And I feel like even though somebody could turn around and say, yeah, but then if you really want children, you could have spent the money on, on that. But then in my mind, I'm just like, having come been a refugee myself coming from immigrant parents it's really important to me that I do have a home I, I am financially stable and I have all the access to you know like to everything to provide a healthy environment for my child growing up I don't want to make the decisions my parents made and you know having had the childhood that I had which again I don't blame my parents for but I've had to grow up myself and I I don't want that for my kid. I want something else for my kid. And I think to me, it is important that I am settled and I feel like we are not at the moment. And it's sad because my, my clock is ticking. Like I feel like I'm getting older and then it's almost just like, when do you do that? And, you know, I want my husband to be settled and it needs to be a united decision that we're ready to take that step so at least we're having that conversation about surrogacy but you know what maybe next year we might actually say to each other you know what we're okay we don't we don't want any children we don't need to go through surrogacy and we're fine with it and stuff and that needs to be a decision we make ourselves so at this stage I would say we're having a very open conversation with my parents with my mother-in-law me and my husband we're all having a conversation about surrogacy but nothing's been done at the moment because we're still trying to settle into our new home and our new life back in the UK. Mm. No, completely get that. And I think it's actually a responsible thing to do to make sure you are financially stable before having children. Cause I'm sure anyone who has kids or, you know, knows what it's like to raise kids would say how expensive they are and the commitment that goes into raising children. So actually it's very responsible the way you're thinking about it because I think some people don't realize the the level of commitment and then they just go oh we'll just have kids like it's like they're gonna you know it's a very easy breezy decision and then once they've had children it's like oh and the penny drops but yeah. by that point the children helps. already the it world. helps um having friends who obviously a lot of my friends have kids who are like nearly 10 or maybe even over 10 years old so I'm able to have that conversation where I ask them so how much do you pay for this private school or how much do you pay for this and what do you do and how you know and then you, so you 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 understand what's needed whether it's financially or emotionally you know a lot of my friends are careers women and you know they try and balance out how much time they spend with their kids and things like that so it's just understanding what how they raise their children and the relationships that they have with their children obviously makes you realize what kind of commitment you you know you need to to have towards your children so it's not just financial stability but mentally as well right like you need to be in a good place to know okay I, I'm going to be that mother that wants to be there for their kid and be there for them provide for them and be mentally mature and stable and healthy enough to kind of be there for them which sometimes I do struggle with that I, I suffered from depression for a really long time so I have my triggers and children is definitely one of them and and I feel like I need to work on that as well so yeah so god knows maybe I I will be fine and next year I might have a baby on the way god knows or or it might be a case where we're both just completely fine and happy and you know Absolutely. And one more thing I wanted to say about people who judge in real life or online. I feel like those people are the people who don't have any problems conceiving, who don't know anything about surrogacy, who don't know anything about adoption, because if they even knew about not being able to conceive alone, let alone the surrogacy process, the cost of it, the process for adoption, 
they would realize that it's not a decision you can just make overnight. It's a long-winded, super expensive decision. So I do feel like it comes from a place of ignorance as well in a way. But anyway, the conclusion on that is like, it's your life, it's your body. And, you know, it's yours and your partner's decision, like you said, at the end of the day. Yeah. No, thank you for saying that. <laughs> it's the truth. What would you like people to take away from this talk today, I guess? If if, if anything, what would you like them to take away? Well, I, I really hope that whoever's watching, if they are going through this battle you know mentally as well like dealing with this whole well not being able to conceive I guess just that more than physically trying to physically fix yourself and going to all these like sort of you know appointments and speaking to all these professionals and stuff like it's really really important that you mentally understand what's going on and mentally accept and still feel special and great and don't you know I I think that's the most important thing is just how you feel about it and that's the most important thing it's like to address that yourself like what you what you know what it is that bothers you so much and stuff because physically if if that's the case you can't conceive physically it is hard to do something about it like I feel like so it's really really important to mentally deal with it have these open discussions and things like that but also now that everyone's on social media as well to be more I guess, considerate and empathetic towards other women as well, like, you know, and to be a bit more aware, you know, what you put out there and what you say to another woman. So I think it's several things. It's not just one thing, it's several things. But I think the most important thing is to have open discussions about it with the people you care about and love, I guess that's that's probably the most important. Absolutely. And and that's the whole reason that I wanted to start this series because I wanted to like you said get these open conversations out there even if it means like five people watch it and it helps one person out of the five that's still in my mind successful because um, not many people are talking about it and that's why I'm so so thankful to you that you agree to even do this video in the first place agree to be a guest agree to talk about this topic honestly you are like I find you very inspirational so I'm very very oh, thank you <laughs> thank you so much and thank you for having me and yeah like I'm happy for anyone watching as well if anyone wants to have a conversation about it with me and you know you can absolutely contact me as well like it, it is a big deal and it's a very sensitive thing so if I can push somebody towards just going and getting that help that they need sure Thank you so much. As always, if anybody wants to comment down below, please do. Like I said in my last video, I have a very supportive community and I'm, I'm sure the majority of you will be very kind and supportive to one another. So please, let's just be respectful. This is a, a safe space, like I always, always say. And like Vithya said, you know, if you want to reach out, she's so kindly offered that. But again, I, you know, please, let's keep it respectful and just support one another thank you so much with you for being a guest on today's topic and I didn't even explain but it looks like I'm in a dungeon but I'm <laughs> I'm in a different time zone I'm in Korea so it's nighttime right now and this is in London so it's morning for her right now yeah but it is <laughs> we're very international um, but thank you so much for watching and thank you to Vithya and I hope to see you on the next series and topic Take care. Looking forward to it. <laughs> Bye.